All right. And I'm going to turn it over to Kathy. Okay. Um, just a, a warning that uh, the lingering effects of COVID leave my voice sometimes exiting. <laughs> so Yogi might take over at one point. But I just really want to thank everybody for being here today, and especially to you, Woody and Giovannina, for making these evenings possible. You've done a great job all year, and we appreciate it. Um, I'm Kathy Carosfeld, but you guys all know me from Name BC. I just want us all to remember that we're coming together this evening from many places throughout the Pacific Northwest, and we all live and work on the lands where different Indigenous peoples have lived for thousands of years. And we are grateful to be able to connect all of our work to their lands. I'd, I ask you to please take time to appreciate the traditional territories and the people of those territories on which you live, play and work, not only today, but in your day-to-day -day life as well. Here on Vancouver Island, Yogi and I are grateful to live, work and play in the beautiful land of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. Tonight, it's my great honor to introduce Yelmer Wenstab, also known as Tlepik. Did I get that right? Tlepik. Can you tell me how I should say it? Perfect, Kathy. Okay. <laughs> Our family first met Yelmer when he was a toddler living on Sardis Island in Barclay Sound in Hawaii First Nations territory. Even at a very young age, his creativity, his clever mind, and his sense of humor made it clear that he would have an important impact on any, any path that he chose in his life. Yelmer's development as an artist and educator were already blossoming during high school and university when he provided a powerful youth voice to the Assembly of First Nations and was also developing his skills with carving. Later, he completed a master's in fine arts at UVic with a number of very innovative pieces that the department I think likely never had really experienced or appreciated before. Uh, before. And there are many stories to go along with this, this <laughs> statement, but we thought it might be better to leave those to a time when we're not being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> Soon um, after this, Yelmer was already teaching First Nations arts, culture, and, and history at Camosun College. And through all of that, he's always been breaking down barriers and using his unique sense of humor and irony to pose difficult questions about respect, reconciliation, and environmental issues. When you add to this his perseverance, honesty, integrity, his powerful voice, and his dedication to his family, a young man like no other emerges, one who cherishes family and honesty above all else, respects all life, lives by the understanding that everything is connected, and creates change where change is needed. Yelmer now lives in his nation's territory with a growing and amazing family. He is creating art and together with his wife, Annika, running their Cedar House Gallery in Uculet. It's a treasure trove of great local indigenous art, including his own. It's also housed in an iconic building designed and built by his grandfather. And their gallery now represents a gathering place for people from everywhere to come to understand and respect different cultures in a good way. Together with his younger brother, Timmy, and the ever-present support of his amazing family, he also expresses this passion in many unique initiatives. Songs, dances, art, activism, you name it, he's done it. Just give him a Google search and you'll, you'll see all that's there. We're really honored to have you, Yelmer, and to know that you've carved out time this evening to share your amazing story and your artwork and to discuss the creative process behind your reimagination of the name logo and to reveal the final version. So thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. What a kind introduction. Thank you so much, Kathy and Yogi. Uh, before I started, I was wondering if uh, Timmy, who's with us tonight, wouldn't mind opening us up with just a small introduction and, uh, and a prayer in our language. As Timmy is uh, doing his degree in education right now, Indigenous education, with a special focus on language revitalization. And he's just uh, such a champion of our neutral language and its revitalization. I texted him uh, just to see if he wouldn't mind opening us up uh, in a good way here. And so with uh, all those kind words from, from both of you to start us off, uh, I want to pass it over to Tim. Shoot. 
Cool. Uh, Uktlasis Chawatua, Uktlasis Timothy Masu, Hristakshit Tla Okwit, Hait Ah Yuthutla, Nutwixu Trent Masu, Uish Um Ixu Jesse Masu, Mat Mixu Tlehbik Yamar Wenstab. My new child's name is Chawatua. My English name is Timothy Masu. I am from Tla Okwit, but I live in Yuthutlit Hahuthli, or Uculit territory. My parents are Trent and Jesse Masu. My older brother is Tlehpik Yamar Wenstab. I would like to do a prayer today in my language to guide us in the right way, guide our spirits in the right way, and give us the strength. Give all of us the strength. Chu. Why Karshlu? Why Karshlu? Haslepi Hotwes. Tlakshi in Nach Aatu Tlahuye. Tlakshi in Tlah Katsiyah Ahku. Kukwi some kinas. Haak misku. Upsah duck up you quash lip muxty. Why cars to why cars to chew? Chew. Thanks very much, Tim. So, as uh, just as we were getting thanks. on, I, thanks, I called Tim. Kathy. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I called Kathy and said, What, what do you want me to talk about? Because I started making a slideshow and I was at 90 slides and I didn't think we could get them all <laughs> into an hour long discussion. So, I thought, well, We'll keep them and I'll skip over some of them and we'll focus on some of them. And Kathy highlighted a few of the works through my master's degree that we'll talk about and and we'll just work our way along. And so if people have questions throughout or if you have a comment or if you want to know something more about a certain work that I, I either didn't spend enough time on or I, or I jumped over really quickly, uh, just feel free to, to turn on your mic and, and shout out at me. Or if you want and you want to use the chat, if you're not someone who uh, who likes talking on the on the on the screen that's fine too and then i think uh folks that are have the admin roles will will bring those questions forward either at the end or if there's something that uh is during the slideshow we can we can address it right there so like i said it's it's somewhat linear but we we're going to break that uh that linear path whenever we want to and we'll end at the at the end we're going to focus in on the the name logo and how we got to that to, to that place as well with the uh, Kathy said final, but I think there's a few more little tweaks that we might we might put into that final uh, logo. So uh, the final as it is now, the final logo is actually. So I'm going to screen share here. So give me a minute because I'm not a Zoom. You'd think by now, you'd think by now, but still not uh, as tech savvy as I could be. Yogi was giving me pointers. Okay, can can folks see that? Nope. Nope. No, not yet. Not okay. yet. We'll try again. <laughs> oh, see, that's what I mean. How about now? Oh, it's doing something. There we go. Yay. We can see your screen, Yalmer, but I don't know if you intended to turn off your own video because we can't see your, your lovely face anymore. <laughs> oh, phew. <laughs> Thank goodness. Uh, I yeah, I did turn off the video because my iPad's on a weird angle. So to scroll, oh, I have sure. to move my iPad over. So you'd see me <laughs> that sideways. That's, that's what we found out before you all got on. You'd see my face <laughs> sideways or you'd see the screen sideways. So um, this works think, too. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go back to my face at the end and you can see my beautiful, my beautiful mugshot. So just to start, start us off, I, I wanted to pull up this photo of, uh, of home. I as as all of you now know, I think my name is Yelmer Wenstab. My traditional name is Tehpik. I come from the Tilokwit First Nation, but I was I was really raised here in in Hoyat territory. This is uh, Sardis Island or Copper Island, which is off of Banfield, about five miles. And and this is where where I grew up. This is this is where my heart my heart still lies. And uh, and in, this is where a lot of a lot of my inspiration, I guess, initially came from, and and still does come from. And this here, as some of you may recognize, is Mears Island, which is where my father's from. This is Tolokwit territory and where we live now. So, so I live uh, at Tyastanis, which is just up from Long Beach, which is part of our, one of our communities here, from up from Asawasta, which is one of our historic villages. I live here with my, my wife and my two beautiful little children, Humis and Sinqua. And, and all the places that I live, in, including when I lived in Victoria, just down the street from Kathy and Yogi, uh, all these places are, are places that have a, a big important part of, of my journey and they've had a big impact on how 
I make art and how I see the world and how I recognize my my place in the world as well. And so I just wanted to start with those those two places because they're such a an important part of my practice as an artist and just an important part of myself as as uh, as Yelmer. They've they really made me and shaped me to be who I am. So, like I said, we'll we'll start with a bit of a linear story when it comes to when it comes to sharing the artwork. So I, I first started carving when I was 15. I and I didn't intend to start carving. I was invited to be part of our family dance. We have a kingfisher dance that was coming back to our community. And there was a big celebration, a big potlatch that was coming up. And so all the cousins were to be part of this, this big ceremony. And so we were being taught this dance and it was a, a kingfisher dance. There's eight dancers. And it was really my first big introduction to, to our Tlopiate culture. And it was such a big part of my life. It was a really pivotal moment in my life that summer of learning this dance. I think the dance goes on for about half an hour and every step is so important. You have to really become, become that kingfisher. And so we practiced and practiced. I think it was two or three times a, a week. We, we go to culture practice and prepare this dance and we learn the new steps and you learn the song and you had to really feel it. And I started off pretty, pretty uh, bumpy, well, to say the least. But as we practiced and practiced, we got, you know, you became, you became part of that, uh, that transformation happens and you go from being a dancer to being, bringing that to life, bringing that kingfisher to life. And there was a, a dress rehearsal about a week before the potlatch where we were going to try on the regalia and, and dance it all the way through. And so I was so excited. I got to go pick up the regalia to go pick up the masks and the, and the shawls for the dance. And we, we drove from, from Ukulit to Port Alberni and we got there and there was this tiny little duffel bag, uh, about the size of a gym bag. And I was imagining, you know, there's eight dancers, there's eight masks, there's, there's 16 shawls because we switch our regalia halfway through the song. And I was imagining this, you know, the great crates of, of masks and there was this tiny little duffel bag. And inside of it was these cardboard folded up eagle masks. Somewhere in the, in the transition of the last hundred and something years, the regalia went missing and it was replaced with these cardboard masks and it was such a heartbreaking experience for me because I, we had you know all of the cousins all of those who were learning this dance we had been putting all of our energy into into this and there we were with this really kind of ad hoc regalia that was made out of cardboard and, and just so disheartening and and so I came home and I was just so emotional I was so upset and uh, we went down to, to see my granddad, my mom's dad, Wayne Wenstob, and, and I was telling him how upset I was. And he said, okay, well, let's go, let's go carve a mask then. And, uh, and, you know, kind of through blubbery tears said, yeah, right. And he went, no, no, come on, let's go. So we went down to the basement and he grabbed the chainsaw and a block of wood. And by the end of that, that afternoon, we had uh, a mask blocked out and he said, well, you have to go and ask. My mom said, you have to go and ask the family or, our, 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 uh, Grandma Precious, who's now since passed away, but you have to go ask Grandma Precious if we're doing it the right way and if we have permission to make these these masks in, in replacement of the masks that were lost. So we took the mask to the potlatch, that the, the dance practice, and uh, and showed them to her. And she said, Yeah, if you can do it, if you can make eight masks in a week and all the regalia, then go ahead. So we went home and that's really that's really all we did. It was this uh a crash course just by experience. So we started carving. And, and this is what you see here is me putting a, one of the mock-up masks. This is the one we made in, in preparation. So we use this one to, to make all the others, to create the others off of this. You can see the, the cedar bark on the top. So we had to really learn all the steps in, in creating not a piece of artwork, but a piece of regalia. Something that was a cultural item, something that was gonna be danced and brought to life. And it wasn't just the process of, you know, grabbing the chainsaw and carving something. It was then it had to be light enough to be danced. It had to be danced for, like I said, you know, 20, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. It was a whole process that went into it. And it was such a, uh, an experience that week of, of finding out how to paint them and how to finish them and how to fit them on a dancer's head, how to make them wide enough, all the steps that went into it. And once they were finished, then we had to put them into a box and they had to go in a certain direction and they had to be brought to life. These weren't just, like I said, they're not just art forms. They were, they were living beings in, in a way. So we took them to an elder who, who breathed life into them. 
And in that, we were not allowed to open the box until the potlatch. You weren't allowed to bring them out and hang them on the wall and show them off. You had created life. And it was the closest that, uh, as, a, as a man, I think you'll ever get to creating life in, in terms of artwork and in terms of human beings. I now have my two little kids. And it's nothing like that. But at the same time, the responsibility was so true and so real that when that ceremony was done and they were, they were blessed, they became these living beings. And we put them in a box and we've, we've danced them once and we've never opened the box again in, in 15 years because they're not to be brought out. They were such a, it was such an important pivotal point in my life. And, and this one here that you see photographed, this is one that we made that was used for dance practice. It's, it's used as a, as a teaching tool. It's used something to be fun. This one isn't blessed. And so we have it out. We can show kids how to use it. We can, it has an adjustable strap inside. We, we can really teach people about our culture in a way. So in, in a week, we had this huge experience, I guess, like, like a crash course uh, in, in terms of carving and creation. And it just put me on a path that, that I fell in love with, which was, which was art and carving. A few years later, I got to do a mentorship with my grandfather and we, we got a scholarship through the Vancouver Airport, the YBR Art Foundation Scholarship, in which we were given a year and $5,000 to create a work of art. And so we created this totem pole, which tells the story of our family, of the Masu family. And just like that, those regalia that you saw earlier, that mask, this, this tells the, the story of, of kingfishers and the relationship they have to our family and uh, a history of whaling and a history and a story that we probably don't have time to get into. So I, I'll just pull these images up to show them. But this is, you know, a, such a, another such important part of my, my journey as an artist because it really connected back to the very beginning, going back to our family origins, the origins of our family name, that this is really the first Masu that you see there. And, and so it, it was such an important, another hugely important part of, of my journey as an artist and as a carver and to be able to work with all my family and everyone chipped in on it. My granddad and I did a lot of the major work and then we brought it back home to mom and dad and, and they sanded that thing for weeks on end. I'm sure Kathy and Yogi were there sanding as well. And the, the teacher from, my, from, from high school was there sanding away on it as well, our science teacher, everyone had, you know, became such a, an important thing for all of us to come together and create. And then it went on display at the airport in Vancouver for a year. And following that, it came home. And, and so it was such a great piece to be able to, to work on. And it also is a scale model for a pole-sized totem pole. So this pole is just, uh, just shy of six feet tall and it's a one third scale model for another log that we have to carve the full pole that will go up in our community uh, someday when we have time. I was doing this while, while also going to UVic. So I, this, at the same time, I had got accepted into the arts program uh, in, the, in my undergrad at, at the University of Victoria. And I had thought I'd be able to carve and create work while I was there and was faced, and Kathy kind of alluded to it a little bit in the beginning, I was faced with uh, a pretty, pretty solid brick wall that in which they didn't want Indigenous art to be created in, in the program. And they called the art I was making craft, that it wasn't uh, up to the standard of contemporary art. And, and it was a really difficult number of years, actually, in which I, I was trying to continue to carve, of course, and I, I continued to carve throughout the whole program, but it was always being up against instructors who refused to mark the work, instructors who review, refused to consider it artwork, they just considered it a craft. And, and so it made for uh, a challenge that I had to overcome in which I continued to make the work and kind of shove it, shove it in their face to some extent. Um, this, this being one of them, which I might skip over actually, and I may come back to later. But it was an interesting reflection at that time because I was seeing artwork that was now being hung on the wall, but coming from the first works that I made, which were to be danced and they were really ceremonial and regalia more than they were art. So I was trying to figure out this interesting struggle between you know, what we see as indigenous art in our everyday, which is usually adorning walls and making you know, beautiful spaces, or museums, institutions. I'm sure you've all seen them in those spaces, but you don't see them in the space in which I initially knew them in, which was which was in a potlatch or in a ceremonial space where they're much more authentic and real and, and they really cap capture your attention in a very different way than a mask hanging on the wall when you see it on a, on a dancer's face. 
so then in second year, I think it was it was nearing the the middle of my second year at UVic, I ended up having a brain operation, which really set my artistic career back a little bit at first. I thought uh, ended up being being very mistaken in that, but I, I came out of the brain operation and I, I had to learn how to walk again and I had to learn how to do a lot of things. And one of them that I had to learn how to do was was use my hands, which was the biggest. Uh, emotional challenge I think to overcome over all of them and these were my attempts that finally got me out of out of the uh, the hospital uh, and it was a really difficult thing for me because I, I had lost something that I, I felt was my my gift my ability and I had to relearn it all over again and so in doing that I, I really wanted to start all over again so I started right back from the beginning and carving and and trying to look at the form line so if you look at Northwest Coast Art and it, I'm assuming all of you have, as the name logo is, is a form of Northwest Coast Art. You'll see that form line, the beautiful red and black design that connects everything. And, and I was really wanting to go back as I was relearning to carve and relearning to use my hands. I wanted to relearn form line and, and learn where it really started and originated from. So being at the university, we had these you know, amazing resources at our fingertips. And one of them was the, the bone lab at UVic. And I was looking at skulls and, and these, you know, uh, geometric shapes and, and, and really stylized shapes that were coming from them and trying to learn form line all over again in, in that process. And so here's a, I, I guess we call it a mask, but it's a recreation of a skull done to a scale in which, you know, we see Northwest Coast Art masks. Looking at just copying those shapes from the skull into rebuilding form line. And so I did this for, uh, for an, a few projects in which I was kind of starting right from the very, very beginning and, and expanding back into the, the carving I was doing at that time. While doing that, I also was, was having a, a hard time just getting back to life. And so I wanted to, to carve more and carve bigger. I was, it was really hard for me to work in, in, uh, in small scale, which I was doing before you saw that, that totem pole you know, all very fine, intricate carving. It was really difficult for my hands and my eyes to get back to doing that after the brain operation. And so we started doing this community carving. And at the First People's House in the middle of campus at UVic, we, we'd go every, anytime I got a chance really, and we'd start carving. And my mom and my brother moved down to Victoria to, to look after me and, and get me through classes. And after class, we'd go over to the, the carving shed and we started working on this, these feast bowls, these big feast dishes. And, and everyone became involved and it grew this, this little community, which started with just me wanting to do something to really rehabilitate myself back into, into life. It just grew and grew and grew. And by the end of this project, I think we had over 500 students and, and folks walking by from, from Oak Bay or wherever in Victoria to come and be part of it. And Kath and Yogi were a, a huge part of it. And it was just a space to go and, and heal. And I thought it was really for me. And it grew to be a space that everyone really needed. It was a space in which people could come together without uh, bias, without, without all the things that we carry with us, all the luggage that we carry and just sit and carve and talk together and laugh and share a meal. And at the end of this, we created these. So each one of those is a feast dish. They're about four feet long, maybe a little bit more, four and a half feet long. And they all connect on, on train, like a train. And you can pull it through the, the ceremonial hall and serve food from it. And when it was all finished and said and done, we, we had a huge feast. My mom cooked a, a feast, and I think fed 500 people there at the ceremonial hall at UVic. And it was the first feast bowl train like this that was made in, in over 110 years. And actually the family of, of uh, the last artist who made one, there's, there's one at the Museum of Anthropology at UBC. His family was there and, and got to witness us unveiling this feast bowl train. And it was just such a such an honor to be part of this community that was created from, from coming together to carve. And it was such a good, a good thing that we continued it on. And we started to carve a totem pole at the university. And this is just one of the shots of the pole as it was being started. So it's uh, 30, 31 feet long, this totem pole. It's not actually finished yet. We're, we're hopefully gonna get back to this one soon. But uh, it just, we, we invited people, you know, who were on the campus, who were students who were just walking by to come be part of the, the carving process. And I think this poll had thousands of people work on it. And, and it really kind of grew my understanding of art even bigger. You know, the, the idea of the community coming together and how much 
it meant for all of us, but especially for me and, and healing from that brain operation. I'm gonna skip over this one for now um, and, and continue on this idea of, of uh, through my undergrad of trying to start from the very beginning. So you saw the, the piece with the skulls and relearning form line, and that took us all the way back to petroglyphs and, and looking at historical rock carvings and rock paintings, pictographs and, and petroglyphs. And this piece was, uh, was one that we wanted to put back. It was a Coast Salish petroglyph and we were there in Coast Salish territory. I went and met with the, the local nation and said, I wanted to carve this into the, the corner of the building, uh, which they gave me permission for. Uvic wasn't as happy, uh, but it, once it was there, it was pretty hard to take out. So we, we did this uh, kind of graffiti with a, a compressor and a grinder one, one Sunday afternoon when no one was around and carved this, uh, this petroglyph back into, the, back into the landscape where it once was, now in a concrete berm. I think it made the concrete berm look, look much nicer. Uh, the, the grounds department at UVic wasn't, wasn't as excited about it, but oh well. Uh, and this was just nearing the, the end of my, my undergrad. I was trying to find a way to really educate my instructors, I think was a, was a big part of it, but educate the viewer. Because at that point, when we were looking at indigenous art, the only place people were seeing it really was in a gallery or, or in a museum. And in both those spaces, the only time you see a mask is when it's hung up on the wall or when it's behind glass or when it's so far removed from the people or the culture or the idea of it even being danced, it, it, you wouldn't see that. And so we made, my brother helped me with this and well, everyone helped me with this. We made four of these masks that were a virtual reality. So we invited the viewer to actually pick up the mask and put it on. And inside was a video of Timmy and as a little boy, you know, this is, this is a number of years ago now, it, such great proportions, but he was in there and he was dancing the mask you're wearing. So when you pick the mask up and put it on, you could actually see a dancer moving to a, to a, different, uh, a different dance for each mask. And the viewer was really neat because the viewer, after they got over the fear of picking it up and putting it on, started to mimic the dancer as well as they watched the video inside. So there was four, four masks like this that, that were in a gallery space and we invited the viewer to pick them up and put them on and engage with them. It was really challenging to get the gallery to, to sign on to it. And that's a whole other story, but noticing that we're, we're already on to seven, I'll, I'll skip through that story for now. But you can see different people and they actually start to dance. It was a really neat thing. They, they completely forget that they were, they were being watched by another audience and they kind of became a participant and started to dance. You can see this lady actually dancing with the mask and, and then they take it off and they'd almost be a crowd around them cheering them on. It was a really, a really neat experience. Getting them to try it on, that was the big challenge. Everyone's been, you know, we've been conditioned all our life to never touch artwork. And then I was saying, touch the artwork. So we actually see on the bottom there, it says, please do not touch the artifacts. And then we kind of graffitied the sign to say, please do touch the art. But it was still a challenge to get them to do it sometimes. There was, that was the, the first mock-up, there is a, a broken iPhone in there to make the virtual reality as you can kind of see in that picture. But. So this was the very, I think this is the very end of my, my undergrad and moving away from carving and still trying to figure out how to get indigenous art recognized in the, in the institution that I was in at the time. And I'm gonna skip over this one because it's such a long story, but it, maybe we'll come back to it if, if, it's, if it's desired. And I might skip over this one too. So I, I came to the end of my undergrad and I was, I was just finally breaking the shell, I think. I think I was just kind of finally breaking through to the instructors to understand the work I was making and the reasons I was making it. And so right when I finished, right when I graduated from my undergrad, I reapplied and went back and did my, my MFA in the same program, in the same department. And it was, it was just finally those last, uh, those last few I think the last two semesters maybe of, of my undergrad, I had all these works I was trying to get made, but I had such a stringent uh, turnaround time for the, for the assignments. We had, I think, six, uh, six assignments a, a, a semester. So we had you know, two weeks to create them. And, and I had these bigger projects in mind that I wanted to make. And so I reapplied for the master's really with a bid to say, these are the projects I'm gonna, I'm gonna go off and make and more or less leave me alone because I, I just have to have the time to do them. And so I was really honored to go back into the program and went right in to make this piece here um, and, and followed through with a number of others. And my supervisor was great. He kind of just let me go and, and do my thing. So this one here 
Um, maybe I'll spend the time for the story on this one, but then I'll, I'll skip through the next few. This one here is a, a totem pole made entirely out of two by fours. So there's, uh, I, I think about 25 two by fours around an oil drum in the center. And I was down in Victoria at, at UVic and I was trying to carve and it was so hard to find wood. And any wood that you did find, you know, cedar to go and carve that was, you know, ideally clear, it was either so expensive or, and, more and than or, it was from up north. So it was from our territory and it was, you know, logged up in Tofino area or up the coast and brought back down to Victoria to a mill and milled up and sold for just an outrageous price. And it was such a challenge to be carving and doing what was so natural to me while down in this urban, this urban space. And Victoria really in terms of where, where you know, we all are maybe isn't that urban, but it, it was really a challenge to get access to wood. And so I started thinking about how I can respond to that. So I went to uh, Home Depot and, and bought a truckload of two by fours and came home and said, okay, what can I do? So we carved this uh, flat, actually. We had to make a mock-up of a, of a totem pole round on canvas and then flattened it out and then carved these two by fours and put it back together again. And the whole time, keeping in mind the idea of, of deforestation and, and the you know, lack of access to, to lumber, the, the inability for carvers to get it. And it's such a traditional practice to carve totem poles and masks and regalia. And to think that there's gonna be a time, you know, if not in my life, in my children's life, where we may not have that access. How are we gonna to continue to, to create and continue to, to have our culture so rich as it was and, and still is? So we made this poll and I put this picture up. It wasn't finished at this point. I put this picture up on Facebook and, uh, and a friend of mine who's an instructor at, at UVic reached out to me and said, you know, would you consider selling this piece? I have a potential, uh, potential buyer who doesn't want to be named at this point in time. And, uh, and I said, yeah, I'd, I'd be, you know, I consider it, but it's for my master's degree. And I said, I, I don't know. I'd have to, you know, we have to kind of talk it out. And she went, okay, well, they have an offer. So she, she gave me their offer and uh, she said, but it, it needs to be packed up in the next week. And the piece wasn't finished at this point. So I said, okay, sure, let's do it. So we, uh, mom and Tim came back down and, and Annika and everyone really, and we laid it out in the backyard and we spent the whole week just carving to finish this thing up. And then someone came, it packed up and shipped off. We never knew who bought it. We never knew where it went. It, it was such a weird experience. And then I had to also go make more work for my master's degree because this was supposed to be a piece for the final show. Uh, and, and off it went. And that was that. And we got a check. And you thought, well, that was a weird experience. You know, at that point, I never sold contemporary art and I hadn't really sold uh, Northwest Coast art at all, any, any of my work really at that point. And the piece was gone. And I was like, you know, so off, off to work again. And then about six months later, I get a phone call from uh, a, an Ottawa number. And I, the, the gentleman on the phone said, you, you know, he has, they've acquired this piece of mine and they're, they're wanting to set it up, but they have a, a few questions. And, and I, so I said, well, where, where did the piece go? And he, and he said, well, it's, it's here in Ottawa. It's actually in, it's actually in Gatineau in Quebec. And it's set up in the lobby and it's just making this awful odor. And I said, well, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of told when you bought the piece, I had told you that it's two by fours around an, an oil drum and it's a real oil drum full of oil. We washed it out to the best extent we could, but it's an oil barrel. You said you wanted it just as is. And, uh, and he said, well, do you have any ideas about how to get the smell of oil out? Because the whole lobby stinks like oil. And, and I said, well, you can get another barrel. That would be my best suggestion, as I suggested before when I, when I sold it to you. And he went, no, no, we want to keep the piece all, all original as it was when you made it as the artist. And I said, well, where is the piece? I'm, I'm really curious. And he said, well, it's in the, it's in the lobby of uh, Indigenous Services Canada, in, uh, which is in, really, it's, it, for those who are, are Canadian, it's, it's, uh, it's the Department of Indian Affairs. And, and it was just the most fitting location for this piece to end up. And, you know, it, so it was bought by the government of Canada and it was really a, uh, a so, somewhat of an FU to the government of Canada, but it was, it was purchased by the government of Canada and it was installed at the Indigenous Services Canada building, which is Indian Affairs building in Ottawa. And, and it just filled the lobby with this awful smell of oil. I thought, well, isn't it, you know, what a reversal, right? What a, <laughs> what a place for it to end up. And it was really the happiest thing for it to, to do for me was to end up back in, in the people who I was criticizing in the piece. It, it kind of went back to them, which was just such a weird experience, but a fantastic experience. I ended up getting 
uh, a trip to Ottawa to actually work with them to, to hire or to, to um, find other artists for their acquisition program. And I went to the lobby to go see the piece and it was deinstalled because they couldn't deal with the smell of oil filling their lobby. And it was often a storage unit somewhere outside of outside of town. But they took me out and we set the piece up again out in the storage unit. And I, I thought it was such a fitting, a fitting end to the work. Uh, but then I found out later it actually got installed at the National Gallery uh, for a show that was was at the National Gallery in Ottawa. So it did get it did get put up again, but it was to me just such a, a an ir an ironic piece already. But then to be bought by Indian Affairs, it just went uh, right where I wanted it to go. All right, I see we're running out of time, so I'm going to skip through some of the more of the the master's works. Uh, this one was a piece kind of after that one. The uh, government of Canada during the, the Canada 150 celebrations the same year decided to buy a pipeline. And this was a work in response to that and very similar and kind of heavy handed as the two by four piece. But I'll skip over this one for now because just recognizing the time. So that same piece, it's lit from the inside, the oil barrels and uh, the negative cutout space, the form line space actually projects on the walls. And it's it's a neat piece because people walk in and they they see it like that. And they, it's quite beautiful, really, in, in in some in some way. And people say, "Wow, what a beautiful piece!" Until you walk around and spend time with it, and and again have these oil barrels dripping it on the floor. But I'll I'll skip this piece for now because I'm just recognizing the time. So I think you can all see the the theme throughout this time through through the master's work, which is really the height of of the Idle No More movement. For those of you who remember the Idle No More movement. Uh, the end of the Harper era into the Trudeau era, which uh, didn't seem to change too much. But at the same time, just trying to navigate these ideas of contemporary Indigenous art. So looking at totem poles and masks and bentwood boxes as historic objects, but also in our communities, I mean, they're still used in, in our life, but they're not known out in the world. So, you know, trying to reflect on these things in a, in a contemporary time. Again, another piece from, from the masters. Uh, this ended up at the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria in their collection. Uh, and I skipped through this one. I think I'll have to skip through this one as well, but but maybe I'll just give it a quick, a, a quick story. This one ended up, uh, it's hanging in um, Prince William's child's room. So this was a gift to the royal family. A gift with, a, with a, and the word gift is kind of given with quotation marks. Because in Nucholnath culture, if you give a gift, it, it's not to, you know, to honor someone necessarily as much as it is to create a relationship with them. So I, I gave it to them saying, you don't have to accept it because the gift comes with a lot of responsibility. And that responsibility is to, is to, you know, start to work towards what we call reconciliation. And, and in giving this drum, I said, if you, if you accept it or don't accept it, uh, that's okay. But if you accept it, you're accepting the responsibility of that work. And the drum was accepted and it went uh, and it's hanging in the children's room of, of William and Kate, uh, their children actually play the drum. I've been told in a letter from, from Buckingham Palace sent to, sent to our, our little band office here in Dufino, which is a whole nother story, which we don't have time for, I don't think. So I started the, you know, my, my, my year at UVic, the, the first year at UVic here, and I really ended my time at UVic here. And it seemed like such a, uh, a you know, huge contrast from from the beauty of of that piece and the time and detail and the story and the family that went into this work to this piece, which is in many ways a kind of a crude rendition of uh, of a totem pole. And so I was trying to find where the balance is between them because really I love to carve. It all started off with the love of carving, and and it ended up becoming really political and becoming questioning the the world we were in at this point in time and. And, and as well education in many ways. And so I, I was trying to find the balance in between the two and an opportunity came up at, at that point to recreate a village uh, for, a, for a celebration that was happening in Victoria. And so I went to Esquimalt Nation and, and we met with, uh, with Song He's in Esquimalt. And I proposed this idea of recreating the Esquimalt village where it used to be, which is where the BC legislature is now in Victoria. And with support from them, we, we went ahead with the Pacific People's Partnership and created a, a kind of a mock village in front of the, the BC legislature for a celebration. And it was really neat because we were creating these longhouse structures, the longhouse fronts that had tents in the back that were 30 feet long. And we, ho we hosted a, a big celebration. 
And in a way, we tried to invite people to come into our house and celebrate with us. And, and the contrast of these, these villages, is this village in front of such a, a monumental building behind it as well, really, I, I think, started to strike that balance of traditional and contemporary art in, in my practice. And so these, the tents were taken off at this point, but these, uh, these long houses are 25 feet long, uh, 25 feet wide and 30 feet long. And we, we hosted hundreds of people to come and celebrate with us. And there was dancing and so much cultural experience for, for everyone to come witness. And it was such a beautiful balance between those two, between that, that you know, the, the true, the, the, the reality of the culture and then also the times that we're in. And they're very, I don't want to say different, but they're, they're very, uh, some ways in opposition to each other. And I think this was a good balance in between. And so you see the four houses and, and this is kind of a, it's maybe a little difficult for folks to see, but there was two houses on each side of the lawn and, and right behind it was that, that huge building of the BC legislature. And it was, it was a really beautiful dichotomy between the two. So then after that, I, I ran from Victoria <laughs> and came home with my little family and continued to carve, but we, we really wanted to, to find that balance in, in another way. And so in 2018, we opened up an art gallery here in Euclid. And it was uh, a way to focus in and share New Chalmath art and, and Northwest Coast art with, uh, with the greater community and, and also to share a space where we could create and make and have a studio and, and be back home and be closer to home. At that point, I'd been in Victoria throughout my undergrad and my master's and then into that, that big project with the, the legislature. And, and I had just missed the, again, the reality of home. And, and you can get so caught up in that fast paced contemporary art world or the fast paced art world of institutions or you know, working at Camosun or I think you all know that feeling or, where you start to lose sight a little bit. And, and so I wanted to come home and we had our little, our little girl and, and Annika and I decided to move home and open up the gallery. And then I started carving. And I think Annika said at that point, when we opened the gallery, said it was the most I've ever seen you carve. Because at that, at that point, I was making things out of styrofoam and oil barrels and, and getting far from where it all, where it all began. Uh, I think Peggy's on the call. Peggy, I'll, I'll get this piece to you soon because Peggy bought this, this work about four years ago. And it's, uh, it hung in the gallery for a few years still. She let, let me keep it for a while and work my way through it. And it actually inspired the name logo a little bit. So uh, I, I owe Peggy uh, another, uh, another thank you for that. Um, recognizing we only have 15 minutes, I'm gonna scroll through really quick here. And if there's something that jumps out, people just, just tell me. Um, but I, I really went back to carving and I went back to looking at traditional work and, and historic work and recreating, recreating objects and, and back to masks and back to trying to find that balance between the two where I don't really want to make cultural objects that hang on the wall. So finding a way to still carve and do the things that I love, but also have some form of education in between them. And so I started working in different scales. I had, well, I don't think I have time for this one, so I'll skip this one. Uh, this was a, a really great, this is my solo show that I had done at, uh, in Victoria a few years ago. And this piece you see here with all those blankets stacked up, uh, I will spend the time on this one just because it was such an honor to be able to make this work. When the city of Victoria was purchased uh, by the Hudson Bay Company, there was uh, something called the Douglas Treaties, which are, are argued to not really be a treaty because they're more of a bill of sale than anything. But the, the downtown and the city of Victoria was, was purchased for 371 blankets and one wool cap. And that's what's recorded in the Douglas Treaties, that there was a purchase between the local nations and chiefs to the Hudson's Bay Company for, for 371 blankets and one wool cap for that, that downtown of Victoria. And I had read that you know, early on in my Indigenous Studies minor degree that I was doing, and I was so shocked. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be neat to see what that looks like? And so I had this opportunity for a, a solo show and I said, I really wanna recreate this. So again, I went to some elders at, at Songhees and I said, would you support me you know, as a New Chalmers artist? I'm not from here, but would you support me in, in showing a visual representation of what that looked like? And so there in that picture, you see 371 blankets and, and one wool cap. And that's all it took to, to take over the whole downtown of or really the, the greater Victoria area. And so that was a piece that I was just really, really thankful to be able to create 
and that's why I say, I mean, all the places that I've lived, you know, if it's if it's Huayat territory or, or back here at home in Tolokwit territory or down in Lekwungen territory where Kathy and Yogi are, they, they've really changed the way I, I look at art and the way I've responded to, to my own work. But again, I got to skip through these. <laughs> uh, this piece, I just wanted to pull up and I won't have time to really talk about it, except it was a recreation of this historical etching that you see on the left. Uh, this is during uh, our village being burnt down um, by a gun, a gunship came in and, and really destroyed the village. And there was an etching that was made that says an, an Indian with a flag of truce in Clayquot Sound, Vancouver Island. And that's a, a paddle, it's far from a flag. And so we recreated this image uh, in, a, in a collaboration with Carly Butler, who's a, an artist here in Ukulit. And it's actually on display down in, uh, on Herald Street in Victoria right now in a gallery window at the architecture company. So I'll send that over to, to Kathy and the name crew there who can pass it on. I think this shows up for another uh, about three weeks, I think. So if folks wanna go down and take a look at it, if you're in the Victoria area, you can see that show that's up there. And it's, it's got a few other pieces that are with it, but this uh, large large printout is, is hanging up there in the, uh, I think it's called the 461 Architecture Company. Uh, they have a little gallery window in collaboration with the city of Victoria. Um, and I'm gonna skip through this one. Then I'm going to skip through this one, and I'm going to skip through. Oh, I got to show this one. <laughs> so this is uh, again looking to strike that balance a little bit. This is a, a collaboration between Timmy and myself, as well as a, a language cohort that Timmy was in when he was doing his his uh, his degree. So I taught with with uh, the program, and they were doing language revitalization, and, and I was teaching an art course that was part of the the program, and showing the com the connection between language and culture. And language and art, we created a performance and a song that Timmy wrote. And so this is a, a song about the re reclamation of language and bringing our language back. And they took a vision statement from the from the program and we turned it into a song. And then I carved the regalia and Timmy is seen here dancing it. So you can see that first mask is carved without a mouth. And then when he transforms, he, he spins really quickly. It's, we did it in slow shots so you could see, but the dancer will spin and take the first mask off and hide it under his cloak. And you can see the second mask underneath in which the, the language is coming back out and he has his voice again. And, uh, and so this, this started us off on a whole different path, which, uh, which Kathy wanted me to share, which was this piece here, which we just made last year, I guess almost two years ago now, that first year of the pandemic, when we were all kind of you know, wondering what's next and, and what, what we're in at that, that point in time as well. Timmy and I created a, a healing song. And so Timmy wrote a song, you know, to, to really bring us forward and to, and to heal in the time we were in. We had so many losses. We had so many challenging times and we weren't able to come together. We weren't able, able to gather. And so we, we created a song together and I created regalia that went with it. And, and we have a video that I put in the link. So the very first, uh, I put in the chat, sorry, the link is the very first uh, first chat that's there in the chat. So folks wanna go afterwards and watch that. Uh, it's a YouTube video that we have and Timmy made the song so anyone can learn it and anyone can use it. And if you turn on closed captioning, you can actually learn the Nuchalna spelling as well as the English translation to the song. And you can see that 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 transformation mask being danced by Tim. And uh, and that song was was again, this kind of collaboration between something that's very traditional and making regalia and making a performance, but also making it something that anyone can access and learn and, and experience. And so Timmy wanted to make that song something that he shares with everyone. And so we've taught it to school groups and we've taught it to my students at Camosun. Timmy's uh, really everywhere he goes, he shares the song and he lets people use it. Because a lot of the times we hear, we hear songs or drumming, we hear, you know, maybe you're, you're welcome to a potlatch, but those are, are very closed doors. You, you don't hear them out in public. And we wanted to educate and share it more, more broadly. And so you can actually go and learn that song and share it with your kids and share it with your family. And, and uh, it's meant to be a song to teach and to bring us together in, a, in another way. So I'm gonna skip through probably all the rest here and we're gonna go down to the, the name logo just because I think we only have five minutes left or so. Um, so, Bear with me for a minute as I, oh, there we are. So when I was approached uh, by Kathy about, about redesigning the logo, I, uh, I came up with a few ideas that we, we sent back and forth. And the first one I had was, was trying to find a way to capture the, the scope in which name works, you know, from, from so far up north and, and down south into, into Oregon. 
and trying to find a way to capture all those that, that come together to make the organization what it is. And so I started off with this idea of, of a map, you know, and, and um, going up from Alaska down to, the, down to Oregon and down the coast and sent this idea back to Kathy and we, we worked around it. And then Kathy said, well, how do, what else captures the whole, the whole coast and what connects us all? And I was thinking to the logo that you have now, which is that salmon and how that is such, a, such an important image to, to where we are. And it's such an important really icon to, to indigenous peoples of, of the West Coast, but also to everyone and the way it connects us and the way it comes back home and that cyclical idea of it all. And so I wanted to play around with the salmon and not just taking the salmon, the logo that's, that's for name already and you know, making it more modern or, or, or you know, transforming it in that way, but really looking at the idea of, of capturing this, you know, this idea of everything being connected. And so I went back to that carving uh, that, that was still hanging on the wall uh, of a salmon egg. So this here is, is, a, is the idea of a salmon egg and you can see the little salmon head kind of poking through. And so I started working that idea again and thanks again to Peggy for letting, she bought the piece and let me keep it. And I've, I've had it now for four years, I think, since she purchased it. So I can keep working the idea out. And, and that inspired the idea of a, of a salmon head, uh, which is a very traditional design. You'll see a, a salmon or trout head design in Bentwood boxes, in, uh, in many of, of the traditional designs on, on longhouse fronts. And so I was working, kind of reworking that idea and, uh, and I sent this, this very rough sketch to Kathy that I drew out in, on Sharpie on a napkin. And, and Kathy was, was kind of liking the idea of combining the two. So we went back and forth. How many times, Kathy? I don't know. <laughs> um, and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth uh, until we came up with something in the middle. So here's just some of the attempts. I took a screenshot of, of the iPad and, and you can see all the times we went back and forth coming up with ideas together, uh, which brought us to this one here. And, and so, like I said, I don't know if it's, I don't know if I'd call it finished quite yet, uh, but there's the final, the final logo for name that we, we created together. And at the same time, I was, I still really liked the idea of that, uh, the, the, the first design I came up with. So we, we kind of settled on sending two logos. So I'm not sure uh, how they're gonna be both worked out uh, together, but here's the two logos that we've come up for, for name and the collaboration back and forth. With, uh, with Kathy and, and probably a, a number of you uh, on the call today. Um, so there we go, there's the big reveal. Uh, and a look at that, we got, we got five, four minutes left for questions. So um, I'll keep on the slideshow for now if, if uh, folks want me to go back to a certain image or, or go forward to a certain image. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks so much. That was a, definitely a bit of a rush, I'm sorry for that. It's wonderful. That's phenomenal. Absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. Wonderful to see your artwork. Um, we didn't have any questions in the chat that I saw. Um, so I think at this point, if people just want to turn their microphones on and we could ask if you have any questions. I have a question, Yelmer. Yeah, of course. The, the salmon trout head. Um, I, I didn't know very much about it before you introduced us to that idea and it's wonderful and it's shared along the coast but I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about it historically sort of what it the salmon trout head story is or is yeah. there one <laughs> <laughs> no there definitely is and, and it's something that's represented in in all those different cultures of which name really is, is encapsulated in right so the idea of the map as well was to to bring those all together every every nation and really every artist has a very unique style but as a Neutronlith artist, we have our own rendition. Uh, you go up to Alaska and you go down the coast and you'll see different renditions of, of form line, of stylized design. But within it, there's an ovoid, which is a really uh, foundational shape. And you, way back when in my slideshow, I skipped over it. There's a great big red ovoid that I made uh, when I was talking about my undergrad degree. But you'll, you'll see that shape come up over and over again in all the cultures. And it would be you know, transformed and changed in many different ways. But the salmon trout head design is something that you see historically through hundreds of years of, of different collections from different nations all up and down the coast. And it's one of those, again, really foundational elements to Bentwood boxes. It's uh, on longhouse fronts, it's on regalia, 
you'll see that salmon trout head design. And it's every single one is different. Every single one has their own unique, un unique spin to it. If it's from the cultural group or if it's from the artist. And so when I came up with it, it was there's so many historical references you could pull from, but every artist has their own style. And so the idea I think of combining in the eye <laughs> This, this map of, of where name is, I think really created a, a way to connect all those different stylized, uh, or all, all those different nations in a, in a certain way, because to have a neutral artist represent everyone, of course, is, is not something that, as we spoke about Kathy, is, is not something that we can really, I feel like I could do, but something that is also connecting all of those nations together in such a foundational element of the artwork is, is how we came to that idea of the design and also just salmon in general and how they connect up and down the coast. I mean, we all have uh, a relationship to salmon as, as traditional nations, but even now in, in these times, we have that connection too. And so I think it was just such a fitting, uh, a fitting design for, for the logo. And I think, uh, you know, going back and forth, like I said, I, I, I'm always torn between which one I'm, you know, between this one and, and, that, and that, that first one there. So there, yeah, such a such a part of, of historic art, and and I think it really fits well to the idea of coming up from from down south all the way up to the north. Thank you. Um, so, do the red um, the red fin looking structures on the nose represent anything? That's a, a U form, so you'll see it throughout uh, a lot of different designs. So you can see it sometimes even in a pattern for like a feather. Uh, on on some of the you know if you look at an eagle or a thunderbird you can see that design in the nose you'll see it on a lot of traditional design depending on which nation you come from they can all have different different meanings and different uses but you see the color it's especially the idea of the red and black which I, at first I, I I'm not a big color guy myself and I'm not really a big painter myself so I went I wanted to go with the most uh, foundational colors which are, are red and black and that you know throughout all those nations that we see represented on that map, you'll see red and black being the most predominant colors, as they were the colors that we had access to to make, so ochre and, and uh, for the red, and then you can see, of course, the black, which which uh, all of us use. So you'll, you'll see those two colors most pr predominant in Northwest Coast Art, and you'll see that, of course, in the name logo as it is uh, currently with that salmon design that's there. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Can I just ask something? Of course. Um, Yalmer, thank you very much for telling us all this. It was fascinating. I'm, I'm Louise Page and I'm in at the University of Victoria. And I just have to say that I was just dumbfounded at the pushback that you got from the fa Faculty of Fine Arts, because certainly in recent years at UVic, they seem to be bending over backwards to try and get <laughs> faculty and departments to figure out ways of incorporating more Indigenous participation in our programs. And I'm thinking, this must be something really quite recent. I mean, have you noticed a change in, in, in attitude? I mean, maybe it's the influence of, of our now president, Kevin Hall, but I, I was really surprised that you got such a resistance to incorporating your, your art <laughs> into your master's program. When was that? So the, it, through the master's, it was much easier. It was really through the undergrad that it was hard. So that was 2011, 2012, somewhere okay. around there. Yeah. And the, I mean, the transformations I think we all see in general has been, has been quite, quite monumental and at the same time really, really feels like slow as molasses. But the, the idea of reconciliation at that point in time, there, there wasn't one. I mean, I, I remember probably in third or fourth year hearing my first land acknowledgement and being quite quite impressed at first and then yeah. falling to, towards lip service at the end you know like it, it, it takes a lot of action and at that point there was none and and so yeah there's big huge transformations in in all these spaces in in institutions and I think at first we don't know how to do it and mm -hmm. and that was the time where people did not know how to do it and you know just seeing the transformations I've been teaching at Camosun and and they're huge and it's been in the last five years six years that it's been happening and there's there's still pushback of course and there's still you know the fact that there's just the bureaucracy of an institution that doesn't know how to deal uh with what reconciliation could be or or isn't we don't we don't really know what the term means yet we're still all working through it right. but at that point in time it just didn't exist it was such a a challenge to to understand i think at that point in time so yeah i, I think there's been big change 
and then at the same time it seems really slow you know so so yeah. well i mean I, I think it's worthwhile for me anyway to be reminded of that because it's, it's sort of slowly been progressing to the point where i'm thinking well surely it's always been like this but it hasn't <laughs> has it <laughs> well, well no and and i think you know I, I was just saying as we got on the call in in getting this presentation ready we i just come back from a road trip with with my mom and my brother and my kids and, and dad we we went into the interior of british columbia not very far we went up to salmon arm and back down and just the devastation across the land it was it was so shocking to see these huge burnouts from from forest mm -hmm. fires and huge washouts from floods and and it you know it seemed like very very shocking to come from that and then re go through this slideshow and look back through old work about you know pipelines and all these things and, and at the same time as we drove along the whole earth was being dug up for a pipeline being laid down mm -hmm. and and it was such a a weird thing to keep talking about reconciliation and relationships between Canada and Indigenous people and and then to see this and then to come back to, to looking at my artwork and and it kind of gives you a whole nother perspective again but it, it's it's happening it's it's and it's happening sometimes too fast even uh this idea of reconciliation because we don't quite no one knows what it means if you ask me to solve what reconciliation meant I, I make art and I put it out in the world and you can take it as you see it or or not that's okay too but institutions are still struggling with understanding what it means and I think in the last number of years at UVic at least what I've seen is big transformation especially in fine arts you know we see people like Carrie Newman coming in and, and totally changing up the positions which used to be there really tokenized positions and and we see the ideas around land acknowledgements saying that's not enough anymore you know yeah. land acknowledgements are we're getting pretty bored of those and, and they're becoming you know just to check the box to move on right. and, and then yeah. you can get the work done so we want to see action too and so I think it's it's changing. It's slow, but it's changing. And we need to be reminded of it, like I do. <laughs> so thank you very much. Well, and and so so do I mean all of us do, you know, because it's it's easy to get cynical. And I think that happened through my undergrad and my master's a bit too. And and then I came home and it was, you know, we can we can pick up picket signs and we can stand on front lawns and we can stand in front of legislatures that we need to do. And we can also go home and remember that at the end of the day, we have to, you know, make our house warm and make our kids happy. And, and so that's been trying to find the balance. I think that's a big part of it for me is to not lose sight of why we're doing these things as well. And, and so trying to find a bit of a balance in the middle, it's, it's a lot of work for everyone. And we get, yeah. we get put these out here, reconcile, go figure it out for your classroom. Well, that's a pretty big challenge for it, for anyone. So yeah, the, the landscape's changing a lot and, uh, and, it's been neat to be able to witness it and record it with art and then go back and look at it again. Sometimes you feel like big changes have happened and then you drive across and see the earth being dug up for a pipeline and you go, oh, man, maybe we're not moving as fast as we thought we were. Well, That's, a cynical note. That's a cynical note to leave it on, wasn't it? <laughs> no, I don't want to leave it that way. I'm going to say thank you very much. I think you're a wonderful ambassador for keeping oh, the process much. going and making it so accessible to everybody. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. I have one more quick question on the name logo, if we have just another minute. Of course. Um, I'm wondering what media you used to create and like all of those iterations that you did, like that screenshot <laughs> that you had of all of the different ones, what media were you working in? Like, you know, to, to create all of those, I'm, I'm curious about that. Well, so as I look at this final one, I go, oh my, I've, I've, I've changed my skill set since this was drawn, which is why I kind of said to Kathy, I don't think it's finished yet. Um, this was all made on well so I, originally I I do not like drawing on the iPad so I, I always draw on paper first and then uh, then we put it on the iPad because there were so many trans transformations that started to take place so that was just a quick sketch and I went back through uh, a little earlier and I, I skipped over them but you can see that it's becoming my my process is to sketch it out quickly and then I hand it off to my my wife and she uh, cleans it up a little bit for me but since doing this, uh, this logo, we've we've learned Procreate, which is a, uh, an app on the iPad, which has been such a great way to smooth out some of these lines. And as I'm looking at it, I go, oh, that could be smoothed out. That can be smoothed out. So I might have to, to call up Kathy. Uh, there's there's going to be another so, iteration. <laughs> excellent. And that's so interesting to me. Um, I, I, I don't know if you know, I, I, I'll introduce myself. I'm Jennifer. I'm the one who does kind of the name back end. And so I have been the person who took your logo and then added the typography and digitized it and 
created a, a file that we can use, you know, on our website and, and mm -hmm. digital communications. And so um, I would love to continue working with you to make sure that it's your work that comes forward and not my like creation of this file that comes forward as a logo. And, and so I use Procreate as well. And so that would be something that if you're willing to continue to collaborate to make sure that the logo that we end up with is, is exactly the one that you want to present as the artist. I'm totally into that. Yeah, that would be wonderful. I like I said, I, I I hadn't seen this in a while. I sent it to Kathy, and then I haven't looked at it in a while. And I'm seeing some of the lines that I go, oh, I'm not happy with that line yet. So I think that'd be a wonderful thing to do together. And it's funny because I look at this and I I feel like I have digitized it into a way that like I look at all this hand drawn you know edges and stuff, and I'm like, oh, those aren't in our final design. And so I I, <laughs> I love some of the imperfections of yeah. like you know you can see that it was done you know by hand by an artist and and not just you know, a bunch of vectors. So well I drew that's, yeah, I drew that's all my those, end of I it. I drew all those curves over and over and over again to make yep. those lines look somewhat <laughs> like a curve. And now I go, well, we have a way to do that much, much smoother. So right? let's, work, let's work back and <laughs> forth and see what we can come up with in the middle. <laughs> awesome. So yeah, if I'm I'm happy to collaborate on that and make sure that that we get the final design that you want. Sounds wonderful. Um and I just would like to say, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, that I, I'm sure we were all really, really impressed, Yelmer, with your ability to kind of marry uh, traditional art with, in a sense, modern art to send a message about the environment. You know, like I, I think your two by four um, totem pole and your uh, oil drums uh, are just great, you know, and like, I just try. I just keep trying to think of how many different ways can we get across the the message that we have to protect Mother Earth and take care of the planet and stop the pipeline and blah blah blah. So anyhow, it just sort of does my heart good <laughs> to see uh, your artwork. Um, oh, thank you so much. I, I can't imagine that anybody would really criticize you for what uh, you're doing there to to marry. Um, traditional art with, in a sense, modern art. H has anybody ever criticized you or? I'm sure they have. I hope they have, because that, that makes you continue to do it and makes you continue to, to argue and fight, you know? I, I mean, I, the, it was great. I, I had my instructor through undergrad who was the one who was the most difficult to deal with. And in the end, we got in a, a, a pretty good fight. And, uh, <laughs> and I finally told him to fuck off. Uh, pardon my <laughs> I forgot it was being recorded, sorry. Uh, and that was probably the best thing to do. And he doesn't remember it now, he says, but I think he just does that to, to continue the argument. And, and, and at that point, you know, I just, I, I finally had enough and I, we, I just tore strips off him and he stood there and pretty much took it. And, and then I continued on making my work and we never really brought it up again. And then when I went to go find a supervisor for my masters, I said, I want you, the guy who I had told, the, you know, Really? Told him. And I said, I want you because you're going to criticize everything I do. You're going to be the one person who's going to fight me on every single thing. And, and that's exactly who I needed. I needed your, your classical, you know, classical artist that, you know, your perfect white male <laughs> from an institution. Like, and he played the role to it to a T. Like I was, and he wanted to play that role. And so everything I made, he, he questioned and, and put down and make me transition and fight and defend it more. And, and that's exactly what I needed. But once the work is made, you know, when it gets put up to be in a show or however it's going to be seen, once it it goes out in the world, yeah, I think it it, it upsets a few people, and and it and it makes people a little, little uncomfortable sometimes, or it makes people laugh, or it makes people have some reaction, and that's exactly what art's supposed to do, and and I think that's when it's you know when it's best is when it's being seen. I definitely, as as an artist, I'm making my work for the audience. I want the audience to see it. I want them to react. Right. And, and really that's who it's for and so when people get upset I it's just a great way to start a conversation with each other and, and, and think <laughs> exactly and, yeah, and, and I think that's what art in in this in this case a lot of this art is is for that and I've, I've skipped over it well this one here was the well no I'll skip that one but I just had a show in in Campbell River with Sonny Asu and uh and it was such a great thing to see his work because his does the same you know there's a lot of indigenous artists contemporary indigenous artists who are trying to find an in-between balance and and really you start to take on the role of a historian and an educator and a politician and maybe an advocate, I guess. And, and yet we just get to call ourselves artists and we get to, 
to, to sit and do our own thing and we don't have to take on any of those roles. And when I was making a lot of those earlier works, there were so many protests at the BC legislature and there was Idle No More and there was marches across Canada. And I went to a few of them and I, it wasn't my scene. Like I, I just didn't want to hold a picket sign and, and shout in a crowd. It just, it, it just wasn't who I am. And so these works are kind of doing the same thing, but for a very specific audience who goes to art galleries and, she, and sees shows and, it, and it, it's doing the same thing, just in a different space in a different way. And I don't have to be there, you know, shouting and, and chanting in a, in a megaphone or with a picket sign. And I think that's quite a, a, a gift really to be able to do that and, and to do it in your own way and have your own voice. But once it's out there, people see it how they see it. And I'm sure they criticize it. That's all right. <laughs> that's a good thing. That's great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I had a question. I was wondering, do you teach or um, at your the gallery studio space that you have now? Well, that was the idea. The idea when we when we opened the gallery was that uh, we, we'd have a studio in the back and, and we'd run the shop and I'd carve all day and then we opened the business and, and we ran around. I, I ran around chasing artists down to buy work and uh, and then and then running around with uh, with tourists asking you questions. And, yeah. and then, <laughs> then I started teaching at Camosun and all my time went really to Camosun to teach there both in the arts department and the indigenous studies department. And then COVID hit. And so we closed the gallery down actually for the, the two years of COVID. We're still closed right now. We're just by appointment. And, um, but we were just starting to get in working with the schools. So we did a few carving projects with the high school. And then we went and did some carving projects with the elementary school. And that's exactly what we were just starting to do when, when COVID kind of settled in. And, and so I went back teaching full-time at Camosun up until just, uh, just recently, I, I just finished my last class at Camosun. Oh. I have a few little intensives I'm doing, but uh, I've stepped away from Camosun so we can focus in back on, on carving here at home. And we actually just got a Canada Council for the Arts grant to carve a totem pole to record the history of, of COVID in our community. And so that we've we put into the grant or to the, the proposal that we that we received that we're going to carve and we're going to bring the daycare uh, students up and we're bringing the elementary school and the high school to come either be part of it in some way or to film it in the process and learn about the, you know, learn about the, the pole in general and also carving. If COVID lets us, we'll, we'll welcome students to come carve on it with us. And that's exactly what we're hoping to go back to be doing. But uh, the last number of years, my, my time's all been given to Camosun while, while I've been teaching there. Wow, all right, thank you. Yeah.